thank you so much for coming to this artist talk today, organized by the South Asia Art Initiative. Um, my name is Asma Ghazmi. I'm an artist and a professor in the art practice department um, and at the Berkeley Center for New Media. Um, I'm also the co-director of the South Asia Art Initiative, along with my colleague, Professor Atri Gupta. Um, I want to speak briefly about the South Asia Art Initiative, uh, which is part of the Institute of South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley. And our mission is to promote research-based conversations and collaborations around the arts of South Asia and its diasporas from the ancient time to the contemporary period. Um, I would like to mention that, that the Art Initiative is generously funded uh, by our wonderful advisory board members, who include Dipti Mathur, Raj and Helen Desai, Renu Agarwal, Kaushi Adi Seishan, um, Anand Rajaraman, and Minal Vazirani. Um, this is the second year of the South Asia Art Initiative's two annual prize. Um, we give out the South Asia Art and Architecture Dissertation Prize, which is given to an outstanding doctoral dissertation on the art, architecture, or the visual cultures of South Asia and its diasporas uh, from any discipline in the arts, humanities, or social sciences. Um, this year, there are two dissertation prize winners. Um, they include Vishal, Kandeval, um, who's at the Department of History of Art at uh, University of Michigan, and Sonali Tingra from the Department of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. Uh, Vishal and Sonali will present their work tomorrow um, on Zoom at the same time at 9 a.m. Um, I hope you can join us then as well. Um, today, we're presenting the South Asia Artist Prize, uh, which is awarded for an outstanding body of work by a recent graduated artist of the South Asian diaspora or someone whose work addresses the politics and cultures of South Asia. Uh, for this prize, applications were solicited from accredited institutions in North America and Europe. Um, in subsequent years, we're hoping to expand beyond this region um, to solicit um, applicants. Um, our jurors this year were Professor uh, Usman Khan from the University of Michigan, uh, Professor Badma Maitland from the California Polytechnic State University, Professor Alan D'Souza, who's the chair of the Art Practice Department at UC Berkeley, and me. Uh, we had a pool of really strong candidates, uh, but in the end, we unanimously picked um, the artist Sabah Qizilbash as this year's Art Prize winner. Sabah Qizilbash is an artist who has the rare combination of having meticulous technical drawing skills and a conceptual rigor. In her research-based works, she creates portals from which one can examine in close detail, the rich and complex historical, geographical, and cultural narratives of South Asia. These narratives challenge the viewer to reconsider received ideas about the nation state, divided borders, and national identity, as Saba synthesizes complexities and connections in the physical and emotional geographies that make up Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and Bangladesh today. Sabah Qizilbash was born in Lahore and she was raised in Abu Dhabi. She has a BFA in painting from the National College of Art in Lahore, Pakistan, and a master's degree in art education from the Rhode Island School of Design um, here in the US. Uh, she's currently finishing a research-based MFA from the Ruskin School of Art at the University of Oxford. Um, Sabah Saba has shown her work extensively. Um, she has 
been showcased at the Goyle Gallery in Karachi, um, at Kodro Fine Art Gallery in Dubai, at the Art Jock in Karachi, uh, the Rotas Gallery in Lahore. Um, she has also exhibited in numerous group shows in locations around the UAE and uh, abroad, um, including at the Akon Gallery in New York. Sabah Khizilbash has received many awards and honors, including a commission by the UAE Unlimited, the Campus Art Dubai Grant, the Salama bin Hamdan Al Nahyan Emerging Artist Fellowship. Um, in 2019, she was the recipient of Vogue Hong Kong Women Artist Award. Um, Sabah is also a teacher, and she's designed a number of community art workshops in Dubai, Lahore, New Delhi and Providence. Um, I'm excited to hear Sabah speak about her work today. Um, and I ask you to join me in warmly welcoming Sabah Fizzlebash. Hello, Asma. Hello, everyone who signed in today. Thank you so much for the introduction. I would like to begin by thanking the South Asia Art Initiative at UC Berkeley, the prize committee consisting of Alan D'Souza, Osman Khan, Adma Maitland, and of course, Asma yourself, for this incredible honor. I would also like to thank my tutor here at the Ruskin School of Art, University of Oxford, Harold Offey, for writing my recommendation for this prize. Um, today, instead of simply presenting my past shows and projects, I would like to use this opportunity to share with you in depth the issues and aesthetics that have led me to where I am today in terms of my practice. A few years ago, as I was preparing for a show in New York curated by Professor Salima Hashmi to commemorate 70 years of the partition of the subcontinent, my research brought me to this section on the Google Maps. On the left side, you can see is Pakistan, and on the top, you can see is India. And what's cutting, trying to cut through the yellow line is the Jammu Sialkot Highway. On the most primal level as an artist, I am drawn to lines, intersections, and compositions. And when I saw this, uh, when I saw this interruption, this erasure, I was completely mesmerized. At that time, when I was preparing for this exhibition, um, I was already exploring structures present in no man's land, barren landscapes, remnants of post-human settlements and checkpoints. But this image here, which shows Pakistan and India divided by the, the Radcliffe line um, and the Sialkot uh, Jammu Highway trying to cut through, um, seemed to me amputated. And this amputation and similar erasure of historic uh, historic roots led me to creating panels and panels of drawings in which I attempted to fill in the gap that was created at the time of partition 74 plus years ago. Um, being one of the eldest in my family amongst the many dozen cousins that I have, I grew up hearing stories from my grandfather about the partition. My grandmother was um, eerily silent about her experience of having moved from Amritsar, but my Aga Chan, my grandfather, would tell us um, on almost literally daily basis, his experiences, his journey, his trials, tribulations, and what he faced as he moved to this new country. Um, and all the stories that he told me stuck in my head. They stuck in my mind, even though I was young then, I was 11, and I heard his stories and I replayed them in my mind, thinking about what that time must have been, what it must have meant to be, a be in a population that was migrating in such a huge number across the border to a land where they were going to set up home and establish businesses for the first time. So looking, going back to the image I just showed you with the erased bit of land between uh, Jammu and Sialkot, I decided to map this route, filling in the gap with the sort of continuity that may have existed at one time. At that time, you see people would travel back and forth between these two cities. Uh, like one would travel between Berkeley to San Francisco or from Oxford to London or from Bar Dubai to Sheikh Zayed Road. And they would travel from uh, Jammu to Sialkot and Sialkot to Jammu to attend work, trade, study, socialize, or, or just for holidays. And um, as you see this line, the Ratcliffe line didn't exist. 
um, what I wanted to do, what I became obsessed with was to try and walk within that gap and fill this gap with infrastructure, walking past ancient ruins, water bodies, churches, mandis, shrines, and to hem this space back together again. And that hemming became an obsession in my practice. And you can see over here in this drawing on the left hand side, there are many monuments and structures that are iconic of Sialkot. And as I make my way across the border, one begins to see iconic structures and uh, landmarks that are, um, are that belong to the region in and around Jammu. So in my practice, I often use the term walking. And when I say walking, I don't literally physically walk. I walk digitally, I look at the map and I think about what I want to draw, what gap do I want to fill between the borders. And I begin to observe that space by looking at online portals, online um, digital archives, as well as um, uh, tourist sites and try and find, uh, find images that I can use. And then I put them together in a landscape that I imagine to be a more complete a visualization of that space. And when I say I'm walking in my drawing, I'm describing the process of drawing because I equate the distance it would take for me to draw from point A to point B with the hours I spent slowly drawing the landscape a centimeter by centimeter because these drawings may seem small, but they are actually very tiny drawings made on a very large scale. So on the way, I keenly observe and record all visible structures that I find which I find to be historically and culturally significant. And I draw and I draw them uh, in a way that I can actually physically walk through them. So in this drawing, I began from um, Sikardu on the very top left corner panel, the nine panels. And I make my way all the way down Baltistan into uh, Kargil. Um, sorry, one second. Yeah. Um, and um, the most interesting part to me in the story of uh, Skardu and Kargil's once united route was the village of Handerman, which is the focal point at the very bottom center panel uh, at the bottom of this drawing. And this village at one time was at the time of partition was part of Pakistan. And during 1971's war, it was occupied by uh, India. Uh, it was lost from Pakistan to India and it became part of India again. So this village has been in 1947, Pakistan, then uh, 1947, it was India, then it became Pakistan and now India again. And um, I have looked at this route to understand that at one time, day um, laborers would travel for in the morning and return in the evening to, um, to uh, you know, uh, go to work on the other side of the border, which the border wasn't even there at that time, but they would make this commute on daily basis. And now in order for the people of Kargil and Skardu to meet because they are still families, they are separated and divided in this in these two cities, the, the commute means, the commute involves making a detour all the way via Delhi and then meeting in um, Saudi Arabia or in Dubai. And even trade for that matter involves um, offshore uh, locations which become very expensive. I mean, this interruption has been a huge toll in terms of uh, the way families have suffered in, this, in these two towns, as well as the way trade and economy has suffered as well. Uh, similarly, in this drawing, um, I have looked at the route between Karachi to Lucknow. I was interested in walking this route to visit the so-called enemy properties that were left behind at the time of partition. You see, at the time of partition, many people migrated from uh, UP to Karachi, and many of them left their belongings back in, in their uh, respective towns, thinking that they're going to return to them one day. And they left them uh, with custodians, or they left them with their neighbors or friends or extended family. And they imagined that they would continue coming back and forth and resolve all their uh, unfinished matters. Um, for the, for the purpose of this drawing, I was uh, imagining, because I do this a lot in my practice, I collapse time, timelines, I collapse um, um, various um, different parallel, I create different parallels by collapsing various different timelines. And in this drawing, what I've done is I have looked at um, uh, a group of people who are wanting to go back from Karachi to Lucknow, 
And for the purposes of doing that, I've created a zip line. I think it's very hard to see it because it's a very small uh, image, but it's a fairly large drawing. So I've drawn a, a zip line that will take them from hills of Kitar Hills uh, in near Karachi all the way down to Lucknow. And now the problem is that when they reach Lucknow, the gravity cannot take them back. And I began to read about what happened at the time of 1965, when war was declared and people, Pakistanis who, had, who were visiting India at that time, were left there, stuck there because the border was sealed. And what they had to do in order to return meant they had to uh, move eastwards towards Bangladesh, which was then um, East Pakistan, and make their way to the sea route via the Bay of Bengal, via going through Chittagong and making their way all the way back to Karachi using the sea route. When I examined the spaces between border, the, the line of Radcliffe and the border between India and Pakistan, I am completely fascinated by stories which can be very painful, can be very, uh, which can seem very um, um, heartbreaking because it involves um, lived experience of people and families who have been divided, as well as communities who struggle to visit back uh, and cross over the border to visit back and see their, visit their shrines and pay homage or pay, uh, or come and, and come for the pilgrimage uh, because of uh, strict visa restrictions and, um, and uh, constant um, um, blockades that happen because of the hostile relations between the two countries. Uh, when I came across the story of Kartarpur, I was completely um, uh, incensed by the idea that here in Pakistan side exists a Gurdwara, which I've drawn in this, in this uh, triptych in the very top in the very right panel, a, white, a small white Gurdwara is the Kartarpur Sahab. And on the other side of the river Ravi, which is in the middle, I drew the Dera Baba Nanak Sahab, Dera Baba Nanak uh, village. What, so all the way back in it, not, uh, 2008, up until 2018, the only way six could view the Kartarpur Sahab was by going into the Dera Baba Nanak uh, village and they had made a viewing viewing station where they would stand on that and through binoculars view Kartarpur Sahab. So I am, I visualized that what if instead of this um, this stretch of uh, River Ravi there was a footbridge that day pilgrims could use without having to make a detour all the way to uh, the Vaga border which is a 120 kilometers detour and just use a day visa or day pass and cross over. Of course, uh, a year later, that dream did come true. And I was uh, be besides myself when I, when we, we all uh, heard on TV that uh, when we were, it was announced that our prime minister at that time, Imran Khan, um, had, um, had initiated uh, and uh, given the green signal to the Kartarpur corridor, which allowed day pilgrims to come across. Uh, without having to make a detour or get an Indian or Pakistani visa for that matter. Um, of course, this happened a year later and this design is not what was used in the, um, in, the, in the current structure that they have made and this is not even logistically possible, but I believe that it's important that we as artists manifest certain initiatives, uh, manifest, manifest certain um, visualizations and think about ways of bringing these, this gap together, whether it's through, um, through images, landscapes, art, music, film, um, and just put it out there in the universe and, 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 let, and let people start to think about what that kind of landscape would look like. Similarly, I looked at uh, another shrine which is on Pakistan side of Kashmir it's called the Shartapit and it is a very important temple to uh, many Kashmiri pundits it's ancient it's old and it hasn't been visited since the partition uh, uh, in this drawing however instead of highlighting the shrine which is probably hard to see in this in this image because it's really way at the back and it's small I didn't emphasize the shrine I emphasized the Titwal crossing over the Neelam river uh, which is called the Christian Ganga River in uh, as it snakes into India. And as it meanders into Pakistan, it's, it's the Neelam River. And I emphasize the opening of the Titwal crossing following an ancient old route that pilgrims took as they went to Shardapit 
via Kashmir in India. Um, it, it just, I just feel like these kind of drawings, this kind of visualization is so important in this day and age to try and see how we can go back and heal and fill in that space that has been created, the fissure that has been created as a result of uh, the partition. I haven't personally been to the shrine, but I have visited a shrine very similar in architecture on the uh, Srinagar side. Um, uh, this one is called uh, Naranak Temple. It's an eighth century temple complex. I found it very fascinating as I stood there and I looked across the valley and I imagined myself in a liminal space. And I love it when that happens where I feel like I'm on the other side of the border and I'm looking back and I'm looking into a mirror and I see that there is so much similarity and when the landscape merges into and across the line of control and one ceases to see where Pakistan begins and India ends and vice versa. And I feel like a lot of possibilities exist in that no man's land, which is what I'm interested in capturing in my drawings. In the past few years, I've also spent a lot of time um, researching and making many, many, many drawings on the Grand Trunk Road. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and as Asma mentioned in my introduction, I grew up in, in Pakistan. I was born in Lahore, but I grew up in UAE, uh, in Abu Dhabi, and then I moved to Pakistan and I finished my higher education from uh, the National College of Arts, where I have a BFA degree in painting. And this, this canon over here, the Zamzama, which many of you may recognize, also called Kim's Canon, uh, also known as the Bhangia Wala Top at one time, is right opposite my college NCA. And this is a fixture that you see as we would walk to Bud Brothers, our stationery shop, which has closed down now on, um, on, in, in Anarkali to buy stationery on daily basis. Um, and I would on TV and in the news constantly read about uh, GT Road, that GT Road is, there's been an accident on GT Road or there's been a blockage or, GT Road was a scary road to me where the big boys drove big trucks. I knew about the Grand Trunk Road, I'd read Kim, I had read uh, about uh, it in many in literature, but I never really pieced it together. It never really occurred to me that GT Road is Grand Trunk Road. And I never really spent time understanding that this road is actually a route, a road that begins all the way from Bangladesh, passes through India, and India is massive, goes through Pakistan and its terminus is in Kabul. And as I began my research and my, and my investigation into this route, this horizontal cutting through of the region, I began to see and understand that there is so much potential in terms of trade, communication, cultural exchange, as well as so much potential for peace if we really try and think about opening up this, this route as it once used to be. Um, in my investigation of this route and mapping of this route, I, I discovered many exciting things like and many exciting structures like caravanserais and coast minars that were mile markers on the, the royal route created to, to uh, indicate to travelers and traders how far they have reached. And you can see in this, in this image over here, there is a, a, a structure that has a protected structure that is in probably been encroached or part of someone's um, courtyard. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see these little drawings that I've done. They are pencil drawings, and I haven't really spoken about my medium or technique, and I'm looking forward to doing that too. These are pencil drawings that I've cast in resin, and I've looked at various segments of the GT road. And I've sort of created these little gems that I could hold on to and carry with me. Um, I often think about, and I think this is because of the, the trauma of the partition that my grandparents uh, experienced and the stories that I've heard, I constantly think about what is that one thing I would hold on in my hand is that if I were to have to leave everything behind. And I created these little gems that I could, that I imagined that I would draw of my, my land or my garden or my space around me and carry with me as little, as little valuable uh, pieces of my past. Uh, I made almost many, many, many such small drawings until the, I reached a point where I ran out of reference images, because as I mentioned earlier, I look at image, I scavenge for images digitally. I don't always have access to these locations um, uh, and I often can't travel to these spaces. So I, I rely heavily on 
uh, tourist sites and um, amateur um, uh, um, blogs where, where people post a lot of very high risk images uh, of their tour of water tourism as well. Uh, when I ran out of images, I began to look at real estate, real estate websites where there were uh, images of plots for sale and they would say uh, two canal plot on GT Road and I would quickly zoom into that image, take a screenshot and try and draw that because that to me was still part of the GT Road that I was trying to map. And as I began to develop a clear understanding of the GT Road, I began a very detailed set of series that were that lasted a whole year actually. The first set, the first set, uh, the first drawing in the series was the mapping of the Grand Trunk, Trunk Road from Kabul to Durham. And uh, so this, in this drawing, you can see I've made a walkable route and I've mapped the route village by village, piecing together cities, towns, and hamlets. I have used Maze Anak, a site of an ancient Buddhist settlement and the largest copper deposit of Afghanistan as my vintage point, which is on the left, to survey the entire route. Of course, I choose the points of focus, I choose my perspective, so I play around with elevation uh, and perspective and I switch and spin Google Earth as I zoom in to the region and I choose where I want to be looking at the, at the, at the landscape, which, uh, which allows me the most uh, vastest and uh, clearest uh, and uninterrupted view of the region. So um, that is a little bit about my process. Um, In the second part of my Grand Trunk Road series, I drew this very, very detailed drawing of charting my route from um, Turkham on the top, all the way down, tracing it to the Waga border on the right. Um, my images are also on my website. So if, you, if you'd like to get a closer look, you can zoom into them and see that you will see a lot of very recognizable uh, landmarks. You'll pass by water dams and uh, iconic mosques, as well as uh, my, my favorite Kartarpur Sahib is once again on the very right hand corner. And in the very, in the foreground, the very front is the orange line, the very controversial orange line of the Lahore Metro, which cuts over and across and sort of helps the viewer exit into the third part of the Grand Trunk Road series, which is from Vaga border to Kolkata. And I really enjoyed this part of uh, this, this uh, set of drawings. These are actually uh, small tiles. Uh, they're pencil drawings, four inches by four inches, and they're coated in resin. That's why the image is a little blurry because it's a bit difficult to document uh, reflective uh, resin drawings. And I um, drew from the border and I passed through the places that I always ached to go and visit. As I mentioned earlier, my grandmother was in Amritsar at the time of migration. I know very little about her history and what she experienced as she crossed over, but I decided to walk through and past uh, monuments that I was always interested in. And I drew the Jallianwala monument, and I even drew my one of my favorite museums called the Partition Museum. As I cut through and walked across the uh, Jalandhar Highway, and I walk all the way past through many cities, and I finally make it to my terminus in this drawing, which is uh, Kolkata. My permanent uh, residence is in Dubai. Um, many of my friends and family and uh, uh, the colleagues know that I'm married to an Indian and it's been a struggle living in India. We tried living in Pakistan and then we decided to move to a place which is neutral and uh, easy place for us to visit home um, and visit Pakistan and visit India as well. Um, and uh, living in Dubai, I've done a lot of drawings where I scan the region. And whenever I view my view from my studio window, I imagine myself in a watchtower and I'm looking out over and across the Arabian Gulf and I'm able to see the region and I feel like because I'm in a neutral place and I've lived in Pakistan and I lived in India I feel like I have this altitude this this elevation from which I can see and understand uh, the space the erasure that I'm trying to address through my practice uh, in this particular drawing I have looked at the Jabal Ali port and I've looked at how to walk from Jabal Ali to Gawadar. 
The stoic is also called um, CPEC, which is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And what I do in this drawing is that I walk all the way around the Arabian Gulf, and I walk from through Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and I finally enter Pakistan's province of Balochistan. And at the forefront, the really exaggerated large container crane is at the port of Gawadar, and it's overarching and trying to cast a shadow, trying to connect to the ports and the um, container cranes in Jabal Ali. Um, this is an emphasis, this is to emphasize the ambitions of the new Dubai, which Gawadar, uh, the, which Pakistan hopes Gawadar to be. And as you see on the very high point on the top corner is Kashgar and the, the Hujra Pass through which the trade, the, the cargo and trade uh, trucks with the, the goods move down. So, I mean, going back to the slide, this is a very different kind of trade compared to the horizontal route, which I, I find, uh, which I previously mentioned, which is the GT road trade. This vertical trade is very different from that horizontal trade that existed for many, has, been, has existed for many centuries. Um, in my examination of the land between the two, between this border of uh, India and Pakistan and the no man's land, I'm always fascinated by natural occurrences, whether they're natural disasters, natural formations, water bodies or water barriers that constantly defy the demarcation that was created and drawn 74 years ago. Whether it's, um, whether it's uh, cross-border smog, which is something we often experience coming in from Punjab and Pakistan, it's like, oh, the smog is coming from India, or, or it's because of Diwali, there's always some blame game happening. Or whether it's uh, sad occurrences like uh, the 2005 earthquake that devastated uh, Kashmir, or the 2014 flooding that completely submerged the valley. Um, and when that happens, I am very aware and alert, and I've become very keen in my observation to try and understand what are the stories that are emerging from this kind of submergence of the border? What kind of acts of kindness and act, acts of generosity are, are taking place? And how are the governments and how are the activists and people coming together to come up with, with humane solutions uh, to try and bridge and um, extend themselves at, in this difficult time. In this particular drawing, I've looked at Sir Creek, which was originally called uh, Ban Ganga. And this is a tidal estuary, which is in the, which is, uh, which is in the border of um, Gujarat and Sindh. And uh, it connects India and Pakistan through the Indus River Delta. And this creek flows into the Arabian Sea. And uh, a lot of fishermen, from the Pakistan and Indian side use this, this, this water body to enter Arabian Sea for fishing. But what happens is that when the tide is high, the, what, the flotation barriers and the, the border fencing submerges. And it's very difficult for the fishermen to determine what part, which part of the water body, this creek is India and which part is Pakistan. And often they get arrested. And I've drawn in the front these abandoned boats of these fishermen as they have possibly been arrested in this case as well. Uh, this is a disputed creek and uh, this, this, is, um, um, th this, this space is interesting. This space is, is, is uh, rich with possibilities because I feel like wherever there's a conflict, there is a solution embedded in that conflict. And uh, I have highlighted this, the beauty of this space and the trauma of the people who exist in this space in this, uh, in this drawing. When I mentioned earlier, the floods of 2014 in Kashmir, um, this was another time where um, an entire valley submerged. Um, my husband's entire family, my, my husband's uh, own family uh, were affected deeply by this uh, flooding and they were, their house was underwater for over 10 days. Uh, more than 10 days and uh, the entire first two floors were completely flooded. Um, but once again, my, my 
I, I quickly sprung into action. My mind completely sprung into action, thinking about what is that we can create through this? What kind of bridges can we create? How can we use the situation or exploit the situation to try and find a way to open up blockades, open up uh, pathways? And that's something similar happened at that time. The Teethwal crossing that I showed you going over the Kishan Ganga and Neelam River was actually opened up for families to go across and, and see each other and meet each other midway. And that was a huge uh, concession that was made. So um, in this sketch, I have observed and drawn a lot of debris and a lot of uh, destruction that um, the flooding caused, but at the same time that debris and destruction erased the strong boundary and the checkpoints that one visualizes that may exist between the two, the two parts of Kashmir. Uh, in this drawing, I was looking at, um, this drawing is actually titled Victory Day, 1965. I find it really interesting that if any of you were to Google uh, who won the war, uh, chances are that it will show 1965 between India and Pakistan, because this is one of the wars where in which both the countries claim to have won. And uh, this is one of my rare drawings in which I've drawn uh, figures. And uh, what I've done in this drawing, I've, I've overlapped and, dis uh, and uh, shown a huge uh, compilation of, um, uh, of um, destruction, a huge uh, um, uh, aftermath of bombing and uh, war. And on both sides, I've shown generals and uh, officers from the Pakistan army and the Indian army surveying the destruction or the damages. And they seem very satisfied. Um, on the right hand side, I've shown uh, Pakistani soldiers celebrating victory on the left hand side on the top on the tank that you can see the Indian, um, Indian soldiers. Um, it's just this funny little detail for this drawing. Uh, I was struggling to find um, images of Pakistani soldiers because when I draw, I try to be very true to um, my reference images and I try to be very true to the shrubs and trees and boulders and, and, uh, and even down to the grass that I'm drawing and observing. And I was struggling to find enough images of uh, Pakistani soldiers in Pakistani uniform from 1965 celebrating. So I actually made an exception and I cheated a bit. I found a group of uh, uh, um, cricket, um, a, cr a crowd of cr Pakistani cricket uh, fans celebrating a match. And in one of them, there's even the, the Baba Ji with the white beard, who's he's always everywhere. And I just changed the uniforms and I placed them behind the tank because they seem to have the same sort of um, excitement and jubilance on their face as one would at celebrating uh, victory on, on a, at a scale of war even. And um, of course, I haven't, there are so many places that I haven't visited and I visit them and I walk them through my, my, my drawings on my paper with my pencil. Uh, I'll talk a little bit very quickly about my technique. I work mostly in graphite. I work in pencil. I also use liquid graphite and I create these washes and I work through erasure where I create, a, um, a, I smudge, an area and then I use erasure to try and dig out and excavate different images and structures within that within those um, within that layer. Um, this is one of my drawings that I did of the Kangra earthquake after one of my aunts, my early aunts in Canada told me that my my daddy, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother was briefly abandoned in, in this during this um, uh, earthquake that happened. And I didn't even know she was in uh, uh, in Kangra. I didn't have any idea about that. And I created this drawing to try and come very close to imagining where she may have been, where she may have been protected and, and how I could see her within that little tent that is in the background. Um, once again, I looked at a lot of images from the from the archives and from, um, from various news clippings to try and piece together what the mayhem or the mess that was created looked like at that time. Uh, I have worked, uh, I have made many small uh, history books similar to these where I, uh, I have titled them brief history of, a brief visual history of 
there have been various different battles or they've also been various different conflicts. And each page, most of them have three or four pages, each page is a, a representational detailed drawing on Mylar of um, a significant snapshot of that conflict. Uh, these contain uh, uh, archival drawn, pencil drawings of archival images from uh, war archives of these battles between India and Pakistan. A similar piece over here, uh, a small uh, resin drawing over here as well. Um, this is a, one of my largest drawings uh, that I did. It's, it's also in pencil, uh, but you will notice it's a bit different from my previous drawings where I've used Sumanagashi in the background. Sumanagashi is a technique which is um, uh, similar to Ibru, which is pretty much uh, paper marbling, uh, but it's very thin, it's, it's a Japanese uh, technique, and I've uh, floated color on, um, on, on uh, seaweed um, mixed water, and I have transferred the, the marbling onto the paper, and once it's dry and, and, and flat, I have drawn this um, landscape on it. Uh, this drawing is titled Indostan, and what I've done in this drawing, I've traced the walkable route from um, the mouth of the River Indus all the way to the source. I didn't, at the time I was drawing this, I didn't realize that the source of the River Indus is all the way in Tibet, very close to the sacred Mount Kailash. And it passes through Pakistan, India, the, and Tibet. Uh, and of course, towards Sindh, it drains into the Arabian Sea. And in order to create this route, I had to read many books and I looked at uh, travel logs written by um, uh, Ian Campbell, as well as uh, Dervla Murphy, who in the 70s walked, uh, followed this route and walked across uh, Baltistan with her six-year-old on a mule in the 70s. And she traced it in an attempt to follow it and, and trace it all the way to its source. Um, and I've, of course, I've done this in, uh, in my own drawing. And when I, when I walk through this route, I, I have drawn Mohan Jadaro. I've looked at the Shabazz Kalandas Mazar, and there are many, many monuments that you, you will see and pass through. And there's also K2 in the background, very far away in the background. Here's a little close up of a zoom in, a close up of how I, what my style or my technique is. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I also use uh, liquid graphite and in this drawing I have, uh, I've used a very fine brush to create, to stitch together the landscape. Um, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to try and move uh, forward very quickly as I bring you up to date to what I'm working on here in Oxford. Um, I, I am uh, completing an MFA uh, and um, the reason why I chose to uh, enroll at, in, at the Ruskin School of Art in Oxford instead of any other art school um, internationally is my desire to, and my um, keen desire to access the archives. Uh, and now I feel like I'm reading my, my, my personal statement, but my keen desire to access the archives and libraries here in Oxford. And uh, in doing so, I've had an amazing experience um, looking at maps looking at manuscripts. Here I am looking at the earliest print of the Chachnama, um, the first translation in English of the Chachnama printed in Sindh. Um, I found it really, really um, helpful to be here while I was working on my, my new drawings because I was investigating uh, Pakistan's uh, origins narrative in my current research. And I've been looking at the conquest route that um, the conquest route that Muhammad bin Qasim took from uh, in in eighth century as he came in um, to conquer Sindh, and um, so in this large drawing that I completed last term, uh, I looked at um, this route that begins from Shiraz and goes all the way to Sindh, and according to my research, this con conquest journey began from. Um, began in Shiraz and, um, sorry, I'm just gonna follow this. And this 17 year old commander of the Umayyad empire raised an army and he made his way down to Sindh. Initially, originally I had to think that this was a, 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 this was a sea route that was taken uh, all the way to Sindh, but I didn't realize it was a land route. Um, and 
Of course, as I was working on this route, there were many gaps in the record of this journey and had to choose the closest settlements and a lot of walkable terrains uh, and walkable terrains to uh, assume uh, continuity. And during the course of my research, I discovered the importance of Muscat and hence I've drawn in the foreground Muscat from where a regiment was sent in to assist in this conquest of Sindh. Um, and that's when I got to understand how important uh, Muscat was in the East Indian Ocean Arena uh, and what an important note it was in, in the trade that took place at that time between Sindh, uh, Muscat, and um, Sindh, Debol in Muscat, and so on. As I was investigating this route, I was I came to Multan and I was completely uh, blown away with the, no with the knowledge and understanding that Multan, not only does it have an ancient history, I mean, being from Lahore, you know, I thought Lahore is Lahore and there is no other place better than Lahore in Pakistan. But when I discovered and understood through my walking, through my drawing that Multan has been occupied and conquered by both Mohammed bin Qasim and Alexander the Macedonian, and how they both fought uh, local rajas and eventually conquered Multan, uh, because of its wealth and its importance in terms of its Hindu temples, I began obsessing over the desire to see what would happen if I overlapped such a scenario, which was of both these um, conquerors coming in to Multan, uh, Mohammed bin Qasim and Alexander, and what would happen if I collapsed time and space, which was separated by a, mil a millennium, and what kind of uh, image could I create as I put in both these actors. Um, and as I began to scavenge for images for this drawing, I struggled a bit, of course, because um, uh, there, there aren't any. So I used images from historical dramas, as well as Oliver Stone's Alexander, in which Colin Farrell stars the Alexander. And I, I placed him on uh, the horse, and I placed um, uh, uh, um, Mohit Min Qasim in the, the horse in the front. There's um, uh, Raja Dahir in the back, on the right hand side on the elephant, as well as um, there's Raja Dahir on the other side. And in the background, you can see the debris and destruction and uh, the crumbling uh, Adityah Sun Temple um, and its ruins. Um, very, at, very, at present, the research that I'm doing is. Um, charting the walkable route from Baku all the way to Multan, because a few years ago when I visited Baku, I was uh, completely um, uh, confused by the site of a caravan called Multan Caravan in the Achari Sher, which is uh, the old historical city in Baku. And that was something in the back of my mind that I need to understand what is, what is the significance of Multan in terms of the Silk Route. And uh, in this current drawing that I'm doing for my dissertation, I'm creating uh, a 200 inch, inshallah, a 200 inch scroll in liquid graphite, charting and mapping this route from um, all the way from Baku, passing through all the way from Baku, passing through, um, going around the Caspian Sea, passing through Mashhad. In the background, I see Ashgabat and Hirat, Kandahar, and, and eventually uh, Multan. Kota and then Multan. Uh, as I near the very few last few minutes of my presentation, I'd like to share with you another project that I am currently in talks with the museum here in Oxford for its presentation. Um, in October, uh, some of you may have seen the, this image floating around on, on, the, on, on social media, uh, online as well. In October, when Sotheby's shared an image of these glasses, these were, were promoted as being Shah Jahan's glasses. They were placed on auction, which did not, they, it wasn't a successful auction, but they gained a lot of attention because of how exquisite these glasses were and how beautiful they were and how they were, uh, how the lenses were made with very thinly, um, very thinly carved emeralds and diamonds uh, encrusted around the frame. And the story goes that they may have been made for Shah Jahan because in his, in a desire for him to soothe his eyes as he cried for his wife. And a lot of my friends sent me this image because they were very close to my resin drawings that I do in, in those small um, GT Road series. And my instant urge was to hold them and to examine them and to look at the craftsmanship and to go through the emerald's lens as the shade of green, as I mentioned earlier, is very close to my resin drawings as well. 
but I knew that the likelihood of holding this pair up close was low. Uh, but even here in Oxford, which is and was and is, I would say, the center of imperial thought and colonial acquisitions, I continue to struggle with the issues of access. And it's always a challenge for me to access the special collections and the library treasures here, even at the Bodleian. I have to find and write and make many requests before I'm able to even view them, let alone touch or uh, photograph them. And I feel like it's my right as a student, as a South Asian, as a student of art, whose entire research is based and built upon the result of colonialism in the subcontinent to access everything that was once owned or maybe made or treasured by the people of the subcontinent. But and I knew that the likelihood of that happening was very low. So I uh, here's an image of uh, one of my drawings from, um, from my Gigi Rotis of my resin casts, in, uh, of pencil drawings in resin cast. Um, however, undeniably, Western historians have had and continue to enjoy a special kind of privilege, as we all know, when it comes to viewing and accessing special treasures that belong to our region. And um, I was incensed a bit by this image where I felt like, oh, this is an image that I can never recreate. This is an experience that I can never truly enjoy because I do not have access, because I'm constantly faced with uh, issues of access, being uh, considering my history, considering my passport, considering who I am. And I decided to make my own pair. Um, so, so this was in uh, Michaelmas term in, uh, in October when I approached uh, a very ta talented uh, jewelry artist in Pakistan in Lahore named Chiraz Faisal. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's been a student of mine. He's also now a, a colleague of mine. And we worked together um, tirelessly for a few months trying to understand the pattern, the design, the dimensions, and thinking about what this pair would look like. Uh, this pair that uh, we made is in a silver gilded in gold with zircon surrounding the frame and it has um, green onyx on the sides and they fold out exactly the way uh, the original pair that were up in auction uh, open up as well. But while we were in the process of making our pair, Pharrell William, as you may have also come across on social media, uh, launched and released his own collaboration with Tiffany, calling it his original design. And he uh, um, captioned his post, a new way of looking, which I did not think was a new way of looking. It was the old way of doing things in which you take without acknowledging, occupy, which is not yours and call it your own without uh, crediting who it belonged to. Um, so the pair that I made, uh, has these resin drawings that I'd like to talk very quickly about. In the drawings, I thought that if I'm going to recreate this pair, what is it that I want the viewer to be looking at? What is it that I want the colonial historians to view when they put on this pair of glasses? I don't want them to look at the glory of India, of the wealth that India uh, possessed at one time, or how it led to the Industrial Revolution of, of, uh, for, for England. I want them to look at the mayhem and the chaos that it created as they parted and how the effects of colonialism created a mass population exchange and a mass refugee situation. And I ended up drawing in each lens groups of people as they migrated, holding on to sacks and clothes and, and their bundles of belongings reduced to small bags. These are pencil drawings, minutely drawn and cast in resin um, and embedded in the frame as well. Um, the last image I'd like to show you, and I'm aware that I'm running a bit over time, is that I don't know if you recall the first image I showed you of the erased line between India and Pakistan of the Jammu Sialkot Highway. That was a screenshot of uh, the map that I, a screenshot that I took of the map four years ago. And over here in this image that I looked up a week ago, I noticed that this yellow line had been connected. I don't know how that has happened. I don't know why or who has done it or what the, the technicalities of, of map Google map making is. But all I know and I understand is that when the manifestation of this um, reducing and filling in and patching and hemming of this, of this erasure is going to manifest itself. It's going to create, um, bring about a change, which is very important for us to think and visualize in terms of peace that will help us 
us in the region move forward as a strong, uh, as a strong region, uh, as a strong region. And with that, I bring my presentation uh, to an end, and I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Saba. Um, that was such a generous um, and generative way to um, look at your work. Um, thank you for walking us through it. That was really productive. Um, I just want to mention for uh, for those of you who um, um, might be um, looking to um, to leave, we're going to take an extra ten minutes just to, so that we can um, have some time to ask uh, Saba some questions. Um, it, please, if you have some the questions, you can put it in the Q&A um, and I'll, I'll try to get to it. Um, and uh, Saba, are you okay to stay for an extra 10 minutes? Okay, excellent. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so Saba, uh, you know, there, there are some questions in the q and I think I'll, I'll get to them. Immediately, there's so much um, about your work that um, you know that that moves me. It um, I, I I love the fact that um, you know the the works um, show um, or or the process of erasure um, makes us forget the obstacles that um, break up these spaces, um, and so in that way. Um, you know, I feel the 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 works are hopeful um, and aspirational, um, as well as speculative. And um, you know, during your talk, you talk several times about um, your own inaccessibility to some of these sites. Um, you know, as someone with a very particular passport. Um, so I was wondering about the the politics of um, you know, representing places that, um, that you can't go to. Um, and, um, and I was, um, yeah, so uh, ha, you know, you've talked about it briefly in your talk, but I, I, I wanted to um, take this time to, to have you address that. Thank you, Asma, for that question. Uh, that's a very important question, and I'm extremely aware of, uh, of um, representing certain people, certain regions, um, especially if I haven't traveled to them. And I do it very carefully. And I try and be as, as um, true to that landscape, true to their history as possible. And I never claim to, uh, to, um, to know and understand that situation, that location completely. And I think in that, in, in, in my, my, um, in my desire to show that I'm not from that, that space and I'm traveling to that space, I have reduced the scale to that small minute into the, that small minute details, almost the same scale as when you see land as the plane is landing or taking off. You don't see the people, you don't see the cars until unless you see a very small ant car driving around. But what you do see instead are just the elevation of buildings and structures, very almost very um, almost like post postcard uh, uh, cityscapes as well. And, uh, and I think my desire to show that I am not walking physically through them and I'm viewing them from a, um, from a different perspective, from a different angle, comes from that desire, comes from that acknowledgement. And hence, I try and draw the landscapes as small and as, as scrunched and as, as, um, uh, as distant as possible. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, in the questions, there's um, um, a prompt for you to talk about the scale of the work. And I know in some of the images, the scale was listed, um, but but broadly, can you um, can you talk about how big some of these drawings are? I mean, certainly some are miniature gems, um, but then, you know, how how big are some of the bigger ones? Um, my very large pieces that I showed you in the beginning of the talk, which were, which was the Indostan piece, the, the mapping of the, um, the river Indus is around seven and a half feet wide. I'm saying feet because I'm always confused between inches and centimeters. I'm always having to switch, but it's around seven and a half, half feet wide and around uh, five and a half feet high. My, um, my triptychs, which were of the Kartarpur uh, corridor, the, um, the GT Road uh, Kabul drawing and the CPEG drawing, which was looking at Jabal Ali port are around five feet wide. 
and uh, um, around 60 inches by 15 inches. Um, but the drawing itself is very tiny. I'm actually, I have next to me one of my, my resin stones, so you can get a sense of uh, the scale. And um, the glasses that I made that I hoped to show earlier, but, but I didn't want to interrupt my, my, um, my presentation, is true to size, true to scale. And if I move them in, you can see, get a clear view of the, um, the, the people in it. I use, sometimes I use a magnifying glass as well because I'm going blind, but uh, I am usually fine with a very fine brush. And I think that is part of that is our training at the National College of Art, where we all had to do intense training in a miniature drawing mm -hmm. and make our own brushes and, uh, and, and go really fine in our detail as well. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a question by um, Nida Mulji. Um, to what extent is your art a visualization of future possibilities of peace in South Asia? Is your landscape a longing for what you want to see in future? Or are you reclaiming the identity of the infrastructure? I think our, um, our guest Neda does answers the question really well as well. It's doing both. It's imagining a future, a new future, a future that is actually the past but not quite in that in doing so I collapse future present and past and I keep the space open and as an artist you know we, we we have the ability unlike historians we don't have to stick to a certain strict timeline so in in allowing myself that freedom I collapse all those different uh, tenses past present and future spaces and I hope that in doing so I create a truer picture of a, or a tru truer future or a more just future of what this uh, space could look like. Um, Saba, as someone who um, works in VR, I'm really interested in this notion of research that you described, um, what, which you call walking, which I imagine is a kind of um, virtual walking through space using um, digital maps. Um, can you talk about that re research strategy? Like what, what is that walking that you do? Um, well, uh, Asma, you know, my earlier um, uh, iterations of these drawings uh, were very, um, I hadn't really utilized uh, Google Earth as much as I use it now. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I, I identify a story that I want to highlight. It, it can be based on a newspaper cutting or an incident that has happened between the countries or regionally. And then I, when I narrow down what I want to uh, map or what part of that route I, I want to map, I go on to Google Earth and I zoom into that, that route. And on, on Google Maps, I put in point A and point B and I click on walk. And I see that dotted line trying to convince me that no, go from here, this is safer or go from here, this is more legit. And I drag it up and down trying to align it to the uh, an ancient route that I've read about. And then I go on to Google Earth and I see what does that topography look like. And that is just opens up a whole world of possibilities because tourists and pe people who go and pin locations, they uh, upload photographs with pinning the location as well. So when I click on their pinned images, the most amazing close-ups and bizarre photographs come up of, of um, a small, Un, un, unimportant mosque or even someone's birthday party being celebrated in a village, a remote village. And I pick out little pieces and, uh, and screenshots from those photographs and, I, and they're open source, they are for me to enjoy and I gladly use them. And I look at, uh, look at the land from various perspectives doing so, mm -hmm. from man's eye view, aerial, you know, digitally through the drone shot. And in that sense, I'm able to create a, a, a sort of a 3D VR experience in my mind, at least. Right, right. Um, I think I'll, I'll read this last question by Namita Paul, um, who is wondering if you might share authors and thinkers um, that your work is in conversation with, or artists. Um, 
I'm sorry, I, you, you, uh, I lost you oh. for a second. Oh, sorry about that. So um, Namita Paul asks if you might share some author, authors and thinkers that your work is in conversation with. Oh, um, thank you for asking that question because I, uh, my, my struggle is usually between how much can I read and how much can I draw? And I, there comes a point where I have to put the book down. And very recently, um, I was uh, reading um, uh, um, um, Manan uh, Emmett's um, book, uh, The Conquest, uh, his, his uh, recent book that he, um, on the Chachnama. Um, and I actually interviewed him. Um, he's a historian based in uh, University of Colum uh, Chicago. And I think he just, uh, sorry, University of Columbia. And he just, I think he just spoke at the center as well. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed his, uh, his uh, research, his, his dissertation, his research, and his, 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 uh, one of his books, in which I look at, in which he examines the origin narratives of uh, Pakistan. Um, and I, I found that his, his writing and his theories aligned very strongly with my research as well. And I uh, did a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time unpacking and going through his references in his bibliography, led me to many other uh, writings. Uh, I also read a lot of uh, travelogues uh, in which I'm able to see how, and gain perspective from, um, of people who are physically walking into the land. Um, uh, I also uh, read political, um, political narratives. Um, Steve Cole's um, uh, On the Grand Trunk Road was very interesting to me as he analyzed various uh, political um, ideologies within the subcontinent. So I could, uh, I could view them as I drew uh, and map the, the DT road in terms of how the, uh, the political scenario across India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, not so much Avans and his book has evolved and, um, and developed and uh, unveiled uh, various actors and uh, and influences from international influences as well, um, but um, I, I also spend a lot of time looking at in archives, looking at um, uh, old um, masters' works from our region, um, miniature paintings as well as old maps, um, and that has been a great. I spend a great deal of time in uh, my my time uh, in uh, looking at those as well. Great. Um, thank you so much, Sava. We'll end um, this talk here. Um, it, it has been really fascinating to get to know your work in this way, um, you know, by hearing you talk about it. So um, I am really appreciative and I'm really thankful to all our guests who were here. Um, and um, I'll share all the comments with you. Uh, Saba at, at, at later in an email. Um, thank you for coming and don't forget to um, come to our um, event tomorrow, um, which is the um, dissertation prize um, in art and ar architecture uh, at 9 a.m. Thank you again. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.